this is okay. Okay, uh, the subject I'm going to talk today is one in which I'm not in interested, right? Because I'm not interested in making estimations on how long it will take my, my development. I'm interested in doing the development. But the question comes almost every day and I have to provide an answer. When will my feature be ready? So I thought, okay, let's think this is a domain like any other domain and I have to model something to solve the problem in that domain. Because even with a very simple um, model uh, or solution that is partial and is not uh, totally adequate, uh, is a starting point to start to make uh, increase, uh, increasingly more additions and enhancements or, I don't know. If I capture that some knowledge, maybe we can improve that tool and have the knowledge in the tool, so I won't have to spend a lot of time thinking how long it will take to, to have uh, a feature ready, right? So, uh, the first thing is uh, about the question itself. The question is, when will the feature be ready? Well, I don't think, after thi considering this question uh, for a while, uh, I came to the conclusion that this is not a good question. It's actually a bad question, because we don't know when the feature will be ready, because that will require knowledge about the future. So I think that a better framing of the problem is if probabilities are uh, invited <laughs> to participate. And so a, a, a good way to answer uh, a, a related question is what's the probability to have the, fut the feature ready in say one month or whatever? Uh, could be zero, and I want a model to tell me that, okay? Or uh, you can think the other way around, how long would it take to have the feature ready with some percentage of certainty, okay? So I think the, the first question, uh, uh, this talk is about how to frame these questions and how to answer them, some ideas. Uh, so the main message here is uh, questioning the, the question. So this is not good and these two are appropriate. Okay. Uh, we are talking about measures or metrics. So let's first uh, review some of the few metrics that uh, have to do with uh, the source code. So uh, the first one is, of course, lines of code. So we can count the lines of code of any method like this. In this case, we have four lines of code, right? Very easy. Uh, another one, there are many. I, I'm going to, to show you some few examples uh, and another one is the number of bytes. Why? Because uh, lines of code depends on your formatting, for instance, or the way, the, the layout of, of the source code. Uh, bytes capture something more essential to, to the method, but uh, I cannot count bytes by looking at the source, so I need some kind of printing like this. Uh, I think that all dialects provide a way to, to show these bytes. Uh, so we, can, we have to count this way. Uh, by the way, the method we are measuring is any method, but in this case, is one that has to do with these metrics because uh, references the, the bytecode reader, which provides the second display of the method, uh, and also is able to, to, to give us more information. So the number of bytecodes is uh, independent from the formatting. 
uh, the number of messages. Well, this one you can count the number of message sends both in the source code or in uh, the bytecodes form because uh, you can see uh, we have here two messages. One is on and the other one is message count. And you can see the same information. You can read the same information uh, in the bytecode format because you have the send selector one and send selector two. The others are load, store, or other things which are not send selectors. So the, n the number of message uh, uh, sends here is two. Uh, incursion. This is uh, a little bit more sophisticated. The idea of incursion is you have uh, an object and sends a message to the object. You get an answer and you send another uh, message to the answer and probably you get another answer and send another message. So that the length of that chain is the incursion. This is a metric of quality because uh, if you have a long incursion, then you have to know many things because you have to know the answer to the answer to the answer of uh, different messages, right? So in this case, the incursion is two because the first message on produces an answer, which is reader, and then we send another message, message count, in this case, to reader. So two messages in the same chain. This is the incursion. Arguments, well, this method has no arguments, it's, uh, so the number of arguments is zero. Again, this is an, another metric for complexity because if, you, if your method has many arguments, you have to provide a lot of information, yeah, so it's easier to send unary messages, for instance. And there are many, many metrics, some other maybe subwords, in this case, it's two because it's message count. It's not the number of keywords, but also the numbers of words embedded within every keyword, right? It's, uh, selectors are actually sentences. So if the sentence is too large, it's more complex. So these are s there are many, many uh, metrics. I'm just showing some of them as for introduction to other thing I want to you to consider. The idea is that when you think in metrics, think for instance li lines of code, you will think in a number, okay? And here our measuring gave us numbers. I think that's the wrong approach. So let's uh, have a summary, lines of codes, uh, number of bytecodes, number of sends, incursion, number of arguments, I call it arity, uh, number of words. So these are all metrics for methods, right? You can not ask a class how many arguments it has. Doesn't make sense, okay? Uh, so all of these metrics make sense with methods and some of them could also make sense with classes because you can ask a class how many lines of codes of code uh, it has. So essentially it's this the sum of all the, the, the measures in the in the methods of of the class. But for classes there are a couple of uh, uh, metrics that do not apply to methods. For instance, the number of slots, instance variables, or the number of methods, okay? There might be others. Now, the point here is uh, you can consider methods or classes and many metrics, these and many others, and I want to invite you not to consider these as numbers, but as probability distributions. And what does it mean? This means that instead of asking uh, what's the number of bytecodes of this method? Ask the question, what's the probability to have a method in your system with less than seven bytecodes? What's the probability that a method in your system has less than, 
I don't know, 100 lines of code. What's the probability in your system that a class has less than 10 instance variables? So by introducing probabilities, you will be applying the same content, uh, context to the entire system and not just to an individual piece of the system. If you don't do that, you end up talking about averages. And this is only a part of the truth. Please. No, Colin. Ah, okay. Um, I, I didn't quite follow that. Are you, is there, are you talking about the probability that a specific method will have less than seven bytecodes or that the system will have a method with less than seven bytecodes? The second one. So you have your system and you ask to your system what's the probability to have a method with less than seven lines of code, for instance. Any is method. <laughs> any, what's the probability to find, if I pick a method at random, what's the probability that that method has at most seven lines of course or any number? Okay, thank you. And this is not a theoretical probability. You can actually measure that in your system because you can go count all the um, lines of calls of all your methods and uh, build uh, a frequency table, for instance, and compute uh, cumulative uh, probabilities from there. So it's information that we all have in our systems. So what I'm trying to say is let's use that information. And the way to capture that information is not with averages, is with probability distributions. And the way to talk about this is not to refer to them as numbers, but to refer to them as probability distributions. Once you start thinking th this way, you will start making the right questions, okay? So probability distributions uh, usually are uh, represented uh, in, a cu in the cumulative form. A plot of them looks like, like this one. And uh, the idea is that in the value axis, the x axis, you get the measure and the probability is in the vertical axis. So if you uh, want to know the probability to have um, a method with seven lines of code or less, then you go here to the value seven, go up here and read the answer, okay? Uh, these plots have another property. They are very good to generate samples, random samples. The way to generate a random sample is you go to the plot, pick at random uh, any number of values from this axis, and then project them on the curve and down to the value axis. And this is the sample of your variable. So if you want to have, for instance, a sample representative of your system of, I don't know, 100 methods, then you could, could proceed this way. Uh, pick any random uh, values in this axis, say 100 of them, project them on the curve, come here to this and uh, gather them down here. Then if this is the, for instance, the um, line of code metric, you will get uh, 100 representative line of code methods. Th the same with any other metric. So, but the main message here is not these details, is that metrics are not numbers. <laughs> they are curves, right? So, um, I don't have a uh, very professional 
uh, application to show this. This is something for, for me as a developer, so it's something that plots some metrics. So for instance, on the left, you can, you can see, oops, uh, this is working, this is, thank you. Uh, on the left, there is a tree with all the projects in our system. So I can click on any project and limit the, the, the scope of the search of the measure to that project. Not the entire system, but some part of it, okay? And on the right, I have some uh, metrics. So for instance, uh, this one is um, the number of, uh, this is the message count, one we have seen in one project. So here is the curve. This is the curve I observe in this project and has a mean value, has a standard deviation, has many other uh, estimations, uh, statistical estimations. But um, there is uh, a, a very well-known uh, probability distribution named log normal. And by coincidence, this metric is very similar to log normal. And what I found is that if I go through all the metrics that are well-known, they usually fit very well with the log normal. So this is, for instance, uh, method, uh, uh, lines of code of methods. This is the shape. And so this is real. This is a cur curve fitting, and the fitting is very good. So what I found is that uh, all of these <laughs> metrics are log normal. So first thing is there must be some, something uh, in common among these informations. And uh, bottom line, if you don't have the tools, you, you, you do, you have the tools, but in case you didn't have the tools, you could approximate these metrics with a log normal. And to have a log normal, you only need two numbers, the mean value and the standard deviation. So it's like a, uh, a very simplified model of the observed data. Uh, this is for experimentation. So, but now that we, I will switch the, the microphone. Now that we have this idea of probability distributions and measures and metrics in the system, um, I would like to, to use the same ideas, not for uh, the case of uh, quality metrics of the source code, but uh, to produce some results on the development, on the team, development team, or the process, the development process. Same ideas, different uh, target. So I will keep one of the code metrics, which is the number of methods by class. Not a number, it's a distribution. What's the probability to have such number of methods by class or less, okay? The other one is the unit work, which is the chain set. This is a unit work. It's something you submit for integration, okay? So I would like to know how many methods does a uh, uh, chain set have? Again, this is not the number. There is a probability to have a certain number of methods. And I want to measure the dev team. So the, for the dev team, I propose two metrics. The first one is speed. I enjoy running, but it's not the, that. And the other one is efficiency. I will explain these two right now. So let's concentrate in, in, the, uh, in these metrics, the metrics on the dev team. Uh, we are going to measure people. So speed. Speed is the number of chain sets that get integrated every day. So it's, this is what the dev team is producing. It's not what they write, it's what they get integrated. Okay, there's a difference. You can write a chain set and will never be integrated or will take longer. So 
Again, this uh, is not the number, it's a probability distribution. And this is real. I can go to, I can put all, I have done that, all the chain sets of several years of development, and I, then I can go and get the file, look at the timestamp, and take note uh, the, uh, this file was sent that day, etc. So I can create the, the curve, capture in a curve, uh, the probability of, uh, of having su su such speed. S since this is real, then it includes every delays, holidays, interruptions, people that is uh, absent, uh, vacations, uh, distractions, hardware failures, everything is captured because this is real, okay? So if, if you have chain sets or something similar, then you have this information. And m what I'm saying is use that information to co and compile it in a curve. And that curve represents your speed. Now, the other thing is efficiency. Not every chain set that gets integrated after some time will remain the same. Because, so there is a, a chance of survival for a method, right? So I submit this chain set with three methods. And the chain set gets integrated. But some few months later, or weeks later, or years, the first method is modified, the second is removed, and only the third method survives, as in the original. So the fraction that survives gives you the efficiency. No matter how many uh, chain sets I produce, no matter how my high my speed can be, what matters is also the efficiency what fraction of all that we have been doing made it after in, in, the, in the software after six months? Is that idea clear? Colin? <laughs> Does it mean that a refactory and rename method is inefficient? No, no, no. I, well, yes, you, you modify something. If it's inefficient because you use one name and then you change your mind and you give, uh, gave it another name. So you have to put some brain time. You have to send it again uh, to the integrator. The integrator had to integrate. Documentation change. Many things change. Even if you format the method, there is a lot of tasks involved in the process. The formatted might be trivial, but this triggers many things that could produce errors or m many other things. So this includes all actions, refactorings, deep refactorings, you change everything, renaming, uh, formatting, everything. Please. It depends. Um, yes, the question is, what's the time frame or window you are considering uh, for um, a method to declare it as uh, it survived? Because maybe it survived, uh, if we count the survivals of the last week, more, most of them will have survived. But if we count the survival from the last year, the number is different. I measure that, uh, my proposal is measure that in your system. I measure that and the survival uh, from several years ago uh, was about 35%. So only 35% of all the methods are still there, written years ago. And uh, then the number changes uh, to 40% and 50%. We are refactoring all the time, by the way. Depends on, on, your, on your team. So the other thing is that I'm, my proposal, ah, a question. 
Isn't that uh, that uh, kind of efficient efficiency metrics actually discourage uh, the refactoring effort? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because uh, this is something you don't do every day. This is something you do when this is your last res resort. It's if the, the manager or the client comes and asks the bad question, when will my feature be ready? You can give that person a good answer. It's not something you are measuring all the time. So you don't care. I'm, I'm an observator of the dev team in this, in this role. I'm not criticizing the, the dev team. I'm not co making comparisons. I'm just measuring. So, Yeah, this is not a question, but may maybe the name efficiency is uh, confusing in this maybe. case. Maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe you want a high score. Maybe you want uh, lots of methods replaced. I mean, it's just a measurement. What you do with the number is a different issue. Yes. So the question arrives. We have to answer. Uh, sorry, Leandro seem to be invisible somehow. Um, uh, I use the name the churn metric for that. Re return. Churn. Churn. Yeah, it may, be, it may be not one of the more common English words. It means to churn around as opposed to go directly forward. It signifies you're having to rework what you've done because what you first did was not right, which perhaps captures the concept. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, okay, then we have the, this problem and we want, I want, uh, as I said, I want uh, uh, some tool to provide me the answer and uh, free my time to, to do some programming. So uh, I, there is one thing I have to provide to the system, which is the, the, the feature, the size of the feature. Someone wants a feature, I have to pro have some idea of the size of that feature. So the problem is how can we estimate, s estimate the size of the feature before it is ready without distracting the development team? I, don't, I hate these meetings where people start saying how ma ma many days or weeks. I don't want that kind of discussions in my team. I only want discussions about the domain, the design, those sorts of things. So I want to minimize this. So one solution is to use the number of classes as a proxy. Why? Because uh, I think this is a fairly good solution because uh, I have a metric that says the probability with probabilities uh, the number of methods by class. So by, by giving an estimate of the number of classes and multiplying by the number of methods, probabilistically, I will have a probabilistic measure of the number of methods of uh, the feature that the feature requires. And uh, so this is, I use that number and multiply by the number of methods by class. But remember, these are distributions. So how can I estimate the number of classes? This is a simplification, right? But I want a very simple model. So sketch a preliminary design of the feature. So go to your uh, whiteboard and start adding new classes. This is part of your design. So use your normal design session and once you have the main classes, not all of them, uh, you will notice that there are some classes that are new and some others that are old and participate in this feature. Okay? You don't have to be very exhaustive because all of this is probabilistic. So we won't take this number as a number. We will assign, uh, again, probabilities to the number. So we can count the classes like one, two, three, 3.5 because this is an existing class and 4. Okay? So the more generally, the number of classes 
is the number of classes you see, but each of them with a different, w different weight. I have chosen the weight uh, one half for the old classes because in our case, we know very well our system. But if you are working with a system that you don't know very well, it's much easier to add new classes than to work with old classes, right? So maybe you won't change this from one half to say two, so this will become five and this seven. Okay. There is one more thing, which is the focus we the dev team will put in this feature. Uh, clients and managers always always ask not just the uh, how long it would, ta would it take, but also in under ideal conditions. They always ask that way. I don't know why, because ideal conditions never ex don't exist. So I know that if I allocate 80% of my resources to this feature, I will only have 20% for all the rest, which could be no, no realistic. So a, a way to compute this focus is by, well, count the number of people, how many people will participate, and the time these people will be allocated or dedicated to this project and multiply. But remember that you have the rest for everything else, okay? So I think it, it, this might could be interesting if you have several features and you start keeping track of the focus so you make sure the sum doesn't uh, <laughs> go beyond the 100 limit, for instance. So everything until now are, are so far has been ideas. I don't want to go in detail of how I implemented this. E everyone can pick these ideas and uh, program the uh, implementation. But I, I would like to put all these ideas together. So uh, I have my dev team and I assign for this feature uh, a focus of uh, some fraction, P. P because it's a probability. So uh, my, my model uh, considers the dev team as a producer of chain sets. So chain sets uh, start coming at certain speed, right? But some, because of the focus, g are feature related and some others go to other tasks. So you have to imagine this as two flows. One that goes to the feature and the others that uh, goes to some other place, right? So you have to divide your speed the same way. So essentially you multiply your speed by this fraction P, okay? So then for those chain sets that um, were related to the feature, you have to consider the efficiency because efficiency s says how much ha do we have to write in order to get this in the image some few months later. Thanks. Is that clear? So I have the size of the feature so I know how many methods it will take, but I have to, to write many more methods because I'm not 100% efficient. Some will be changed or removed. So by taking the efficiency, or the other, I don't know, we are going to change the term, uh, into account, we multiply and we get uh, a realistic uh, model of uh, the, the, the effort. So if the size of the feature is this tall and the green part is how much uh, we have already contributed to, to that goal, uh, then I can uh, c calculate the contribution of a new chain set. Now think of this as 
a small talk model that you have programmed. It's like you, you have your dev team, you have your focus, which is not a number, but a probability distribution. You have chain sets. The chain sets had a number of methods. So you get uh, samples of those chain sets. Every member of the sample has a different uh, number of methods, and this corresponds to your probabilities. Then you can reproduce in your model what actually will happen with your, you, with your dev team. And if you apply your metrics, then you will get a probability representation of your team. Okay. Then, once you have that, this is probability, so you get, you, you have to repeat this many times. This is the name th of this technique, is uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So you have to run a Monte Carlo simulation uh, to compile enough evidence of your random uh, samples, okay? So in the first, <coughs> you, you make this experiment and you get uh, the size of the feature with random involved, but based on your initial estimation of number of classes. And then you apply the previous idea of uh, making the, the dev team produce chain sets. Some go here, some go there. Then you apply efficiency uh, to take into account things that get changed. And so you get a number of contributions. So eventually you get here. Then you repeat once again in a second iteration the same but with different samples, random samples. And then again, and you keep repeating this for say, I don't know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 times. It's very fast, I will show you. So here are six, only six. Once you have this, the, <coughs> the height of all, uh, these bars represents the time. So you order the time and you get the curve, which is the, uh, the answer. So, a small demo. Okay. So, here is the, the GUI of this model. The idea is, I have here uh, all the, the metrics I, I'm going to use. Uh, so I have the number of methods by class. I have the methods per chain set, the, the speed, the efficiency, the number of classes, and the focus. All of these have different probability distributions. I don't know if I have, I, I don't want to, to spend time describing that, it's technical. So here you provide the number of classes, Le say, I don't know, 10 classes. This is my feature and you generate some seed for the random generator. You assign some focus, let's say 40% of all my resources, okay? And the number of trials, 1,000. So you run Monte Carlo, and this is the result. So let's look at the, at the result. There is a mean value, so for my dev team, and, and this is actual data, so for m my dev team will uh, spend about 25 days uh, to, to have the feature ready, uh, with certain uh, degree of maturity, because we already have into account the efficiency. It's not like it's ready, but um, many more things have to change in the following weeks. This also includes some level of maturity, okay? And there is a standard deviation uh, which represents the green part of it, of the, of the plot. And here is what the model uh, answers. So for instance, is if I will go here, uh, is I will need 48 uh, days to have the feature ready with 
19% of probability. And now, if I'm happy with 70% of probability, then I need 31 days. So you can read this plot many ways and do interesting questions and get insights from it instead of playing with the number. This is my point. The, the other thing is that this is incredible good fit, has a, an incredible good fit with the no log normal. And there are well-known transformations of data that fit even better. Look at this. This is a well-known transformation. I don't want to be very technical here, but there is a Box Cox paper the, they are the, the, the authors, Bucks and Cox, a classical paper, on how to transform actual data to make it fit a probability distribution. And by uh, using that, <laughs> the, the, the match is Im impressive. So probably by analyzing this model, you can get some other insights. This is new for, for me. If I read this correctly, uh, this feature is going to cost uh, somewhere to between $8,000 and uh, $50,000. If it These are days. Well, yeah, with $1,000 a day, but that's a really large dif difference. That's very interesting. Well, uh, yes, you can translate. This is, uh, uh, you made a very interesting point. I think that you can very easily translate time into money, but not money into time. Because I cannot have something in a microsecond, even if you give me all the money in the world. I need time, not just money. So, so be careful when you translate from days to money. So the interesting question is, um, this is a linearization. Uh, with in which range of feature size will this stay linear? And not, it's not that large. It's never linear. <laughs> it's, it's log normal. Yes, but you made a linearization by making a I multiplication. Well, my model has that uh, simplicity. So, uh, it's simple enough to consider linear things. But I think it's valid because I get a chain set that comes at certain speed, and I consider the number uh, has a number of methods which is random, and all, the only part where I am doing some linear approach is when I multiply the number of classes by the number of methods. But I'm not doing that once. I'm doing that at random, at random many, many times. So any l linear relationship disappears because I'm using that sampling way of probabilistic well of modeling that. If your chain sets stay small enough and stay in the same range of size? No, because uh, I, I don't care the, the size of the chain sets. I, I, I well, in have practice you, you care because then your uh, standard deviation is going to be much larger. I'm not sure I understand. I have because of the model fa failure when you, you multiply, that will not work if the change set is very large. Maybe, I don't know. I, I have to think uh, on that better. Maybe we can discuss later. I, I don't see the problem, but may maybe there is a problem. I don't know. So, this is a very slow machine. Sorry. <laughs> so, so the, uh, uh, let's go back to, to the original question. So, when will the feature we're ready uh, be ready? Is a bad question. I hope you you get got the idea.
what's the probability of having the feature ready in, say, one month or whatever is, is, is the right question. It's one of the, of the right questions. The other one is how long would it take to have the feature within uh, the uh, probability range or certainty of 80%. So to the good questions, you can also al always answer with a graph which will bring more insights and that's it. That's all. Thanks. Leandro, I have two thoughts. Okay. On the one hand, I think I, I offer the speculation that it would be very common to underestimate the number of classes a feature would need. On the other hand, I note that your method means that's the one initial input, and of course, you will notice as soon as you create a class beyond your total. So at least it's, a, it's an underestimate that it's easy to spot. Anyway, those are two thoughts. I'd be interested in your reaction to those thoughts. Yeah, uh, underestimations uh, always happen. Uh, what I'm trying to, to show is a way to underestimate in a scientific way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very similar to what he says. He said, um, why not using other measures like uh, com feature complexity, or different types of things to do in the feature, like uh, I have to write a window, it's not the same as creating reports, uh, those kind of things instead of number of classes, because that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to mm -hmm. get that correctly, yeah. Yes, because I wanted to, to show you the, the fundamental ideas, so you, you can complicate this as much as you wa want, and you should do that, but based on your experience. Do you have some uh, real data how uh, exact you are actually with this uh, probability? I knew so someone would ask that question. No, because um, uh, so far uh, in all the ESOCs I have come, I have tried to transmit uh, the audience uh, things that where I have a lot of experience. And this time I'm using the experience of other fields like probability distributions, Monte Carlo simulations, and simulations in general. And this is uh, something I'm trying to do right now. So I said, well, I can go tell the people what I'm trying to do and get some feedback before it's too late. I will tell you next year. Um, one question, uh, how do you work with uh, new development? I mean, when you don't know so much about the business and you don't know, uh, I don't know, uh, you don't have a already classes writing and all the stuff, how do you, yes. uh, you think that you can use it anyway? Yes, it's if you don't have um, any data because your team is very new, you could still do something which is to, um, propose some log normal distributions and just invent the mean value and the standard deviation. So you don't need uh, actual data because the, the, the excellent fitting between observed information and a, fun a closed function. So you could use that as a start. Sorry to cut off the questions. I just want to try and keep us on track. It's very interesting, and um, I'm sure you got lots of questions, and we could if we could take them sort of after the end of the uh, the other sessions. Okay. So thanks again. <laughs>